This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyamagakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Fiona Ritchie at McGill University in Montreal. Fiona is currently serving as the Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of English. We will cover her career as a literary historian of Shakespeare and Shakespearean theater in the Restoration and 18th century. And we will begin with a look at her forthcoming book, Shakespeare in the Theater, Sarah Siddons and John Philip Kimball. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Okay, Fiona, you are a theater historian of what is called the long 18th century, an <laughs> era that spans from the Restoration period beginning in 1660 to 1830. Is that right? That's, that's my definition of it. I think my my long 18th century might be slightly longer than some other long 18th centuries. I think I, I think yeah. I understand the argument for that. But mm -hmm. we know you from your work on Shakespeare in the 18th century, and particularly on women in Shakespeare in the 18th century, and also from other work that you've done. But first, let us hear something about your forthcoming book entitled Shakespeare in the Theater, Sarah Siddons, and John Philip Kimball. And also welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really nice to, to be here. Um, yeah, so the, the Siddons and Kimball book um, is forthcoming uh, by the end of this year, 2022. And from Arden Bloomsbury, it's for the Shakespeare in the Theatre series that is edited by Peter Holland, uh, uh, Farah Karen Cooper and Stephen Purcell. Um, and the series basically um, looks, each volume looks at a different company or director um, to try and set that, to think about their work in, on Shakespeare, but to try and set it in context with what else they're doing in the theatre at that time. And I think the majority of the books have been very contemporary or recent in focus. So books on Mark Rylance, on um, Nick Heitner and so on. Lucy Monroe's written one on the King's Men. So that's sort of adding some historical dimension and mine is sort of to add a bit of 18th century content <laughs> to this series. And I think I'm right in saying that Sarah Sims is actually gonna be the first woman featured in this series, <laughs> which is uh, kind okay. of amazing to me. But um, I know <clears throat> Liz Schaefer is working on a book on Fuller Deloitte, I think. So there will mm. be others, but um, it was important to me given my work on, on women in Shakespeare to try and bring in that perspective. And so what I decided to do was to think about <clears throat> Siddons and her brother, John Philip Campbell, who were the most famous actors of their generation, the late 18th, early 19th century. And to think about um, what acting together brought them. So what were they able to do by performing alongside each other in the same plays? So the plays that I focus on are really the ones in which they, they worked with each other. And in some ways there's, you know, Siddons is the star of the, of the partnership. She yeah. was, um, she's, she's the older, than her brother. She's yeah. The older sister, right? So she, is, she, yeah. she sort of uh, paved the way for her uh, younger brother. Yeah. yeah. But then he became manager, first of Drury Lane and then of Covent Garden. So in that respect, he has a bit more influence because he can sort of program uh, the repertoire and so on in ways that are not available to her. But they're acting together from, you know, what, one of the earliest documents we have is um, a playbill, I think from 1767, that shows them acting in the provinces as children because they were part of a theatrical family. And then they acted in London together um, from the 1780s onwards. They acted outside London on tour in the regions. So there's a, there's a, a big kind of um, performance history to draw on there of their joint performances. Yeah, well, I, just looking into this, and I think you're going to tell us much more about this in, in this book and in future research we'll get to. But these are actors, not as much Kimball, but Siddons, uh, did not fare well at first and had mm -hmm. to do regional theater and mm -hmm. make a name for herself and make a comeback. And mm -hmm. her, her biography, I'm, I'm sure you go into uh, all of this uh, in the book. And uh, also, I think, uh, in future work on regional theater, which mm -hmm. is so yeah. important. We think of London, we think of uh, Covent Garden, we think of Drury Lane, and those, you know, those big uh, venues that are so famous. But uh, and we, we just see these people uh, in 
in the line, you know, at, at the peak of their careers, you know, already famous, but we don't mm -hmm. see them as they struggle through, do we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, then, and these two were, were born into a theatrical family too. So this is like how they, <laughs> how they grew up. They were on stage with their father's company. Um, their father was a, an actor and a manager. Um, their mother was from a very long line of, of um, theatrical uh, professionals. So all of her family were actors and they were said to get their talent from their mother. Um, they're on stage um, as kind of preteens in this performance um, and then start acting fairly regularly for their father and then leave their father's company and sort of start to make their names on their own. Like their, their parents did not want them <laughs> to go into the theater. Their father did, really did not approve of this. And Simmons at one point was sent off to be a lady's maid um, and Kemble was sent to be a Catholic priest. So he was sent to Douai in France to, to, learn, um, to, to learn the priesthood and then they both escaped from that and <laughs> went back to the theater in the end. Um, and Siddons married a fellow actor in the company, William Siddons. So there was really kind of no escaping it. And they had they had a lot of brothers and sisters also. You know, their brother Charles Campbell became a, a very famous actor and manager. He managed Covent Garden after, after John Philip Campbell. Stephen Campbell was a regional theatre manager. Um, yeah, it just, it's a sort of long lineage that, you know, they are in the middle of, really. Yeah, well, uh, for some of our uh, student listeners, uh, basically, we have a, a tradition uh, in Shakespeare during Shakespeare's time when uh, w women did not uh, play on the stage. The female roles were played by boys. Uh, typically, there's some exceptions, but uh, almost all the time played by boys. And uh, then the theaters were shut down almost completely. Mm -hmm. And in 1660, when uh, in the restoration of Charles, uh, the theater came back and at that time i think it's when uh, women and charles i think was part of this bringing women in onto the stage really is for the first time for an enduring period in a major public stage and so sarah siddons comes on is sort of almost a century afterwards that there's mm -hmm. already a tradition of women on the stage and also women uh, in on Grub Street, there's some writers, aren't there? There, uh, yeah, 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 who were right there. Women playwrights. I mean, beginning with Afra Ben in the Restoration, and then um, a number of women working in Siddons's era, Hannah Cowley, Elizabeth Lynchfold, and people like that. Yeah, yeah. So she's following this tradition, but things were not easy for women, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. when she was coming along, right? Right. Yeah. So I was going to tell you about the the unsuccessful debut that you mentioned. Yeah. So. Yeah. She was um, recruited by David Garrick, who was the manager of Drury Lane um, in the, well, from 1747 to 1776. In 1775, he sent um, his friend Henry Bate to scout Siddons out in Cheltenham. And Henry Bate wrote a letter which was very condescending about the performance space that Siddons was appearing in. He said it was a barn and that it was, you know, she was acting under every disadvantage and yet she shone, she was wonderful. So they recruited her to act at Drury Lane. She took on Portia and the Merchant of Venice um, and is said to have completely failed. So she was at Drury Lane for a single season then and then sort of disappeared back to the provinces and didn't go back to London until 1782. So there was a little interval there where she was back in the provinces um, honing her craft a little bit. Yeah, and the provinces, uh, there's some major venues through uh, mm -hmm. the, and there's, is there a circuit of sorts where you get onto a, uh, a circuit and, and go from town to town? Is that how it works? Yeah, there were various different circuits, actually. So um, the one that Roger Campbell, um, her father, and John Philip Campbell's father ran was in the Midlands. So it was around sort of Worcester, Wolverhampton, Coventry, Warwick. So that's where they acted fairly early on. Um, she also acted with um, the company at Liverpool and Manchester. So those two cities being reasonably close together, they were joined, um, as were the theatres in Bristol and Bath. So there would be some back and forth. The company would sort of act two nights at Bristol, two nights at Bath, and the same in, in Liverpool and Manchester. And she also acted with um, Tate Wilkinson, who's probably the most famous um, provincial manager of the period, um, who had this circuit in York that accompanied, uh, that, that uh, contained York, Leeds, um, Weatherfield and places like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, please correct me if I'm wrong, but when I envisioned the 18th century theater audience mm -hmm. and the types of people who would have come out, I'm, I'm seeing probably fairly well to do people, mm -hmm. but a lot of people and not, not that prohibitive. It, it, it may not have been quite the uh, scene that we get later in the Victorian period, 
but that uh, you could call it uh, truly a, a public, uh, popular mm -hmm. uh, type of theater. Yeah. And that this is Shakespeare before Shakespeare gets into the classroom, uh, gets any of the uh, <laughs> what are investments that uh, have been given to him by uh, academe. This is a wildly popular playwright that's being revived along with some other extraordinarily mm -hmm. Uh, talented writers who are working in in that time but Shakespeare helps drive that engine is that is that yeah. correct yeah I think um when the theaters reopen in 1660 they've been closed for 18 years because of the civil war and the interregnum and you know the managers sort of are allowed to open up again um but there's no, there are no plays <laughs> nobody's been writing plays for the professional theater so uh, it makes sense that they would go back to the previous repertory and it actually we we have very limited data on what was actually performed in in the 1660s um but we know that they did go back to um, a lot of the early modern dramatists beaumont and fletcher were extremely popular there were others that were being performed but sort of a bit later on shakespeare is the one that really takes hold yeah. and part of the reason for that is that shakespeare's work is really seen as incredibly malleable so they can update it, do what they want with it, um, revise it, change the ending, um, find ways to add more female characters now that they have actresses on the stage. Yeah, so yeah. the 18th century kind of popularizes Shakespeare, but a very different to Shakespeare to the one that we know now. Yeah, make, make sure that the ending of Lear, which has never settled well with me, <laughs> you know, that something good happens in that play. I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're asking people to sit there uh, spend time and nothing good happens. So they just decide to, um, uh, is uh, Nathan Tate's Cordelia survives in that. Um, Cordelia uh, survives Tate. and gets to marry Edgar and Edgar reign over the kingdom married. and Leah survives too. It's yeah. It's, okay. It's, it's, yeah. It's, there's some survivors. <laughs> but Gloucester still gets blinded. So, you know, yeah. we've still got that. And yeah. it's, well, it's just too good on stage. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, also taking, you know, that that happy ending um, is actually going back to the source that Shakespeare is working with anyway. So, you know, arguably Shakespeare is the one that's altering the ending of, of the way that the, the play ran originally in the way that the original legend went. Um, mm -hmm. And Nam Tate is just putting it back the way it was. So <laughs> yeah, it sort of makes I, sense in, in a weird way. Yeah, and in some cases, there was a feeling that they were repairing, they were taking this great raw material and refining it. I think yeah. Dryden may have felt that way in his yeah. writing it. Uh, and so they felt this freedom that maybe uh, we don't feel as much now, you know. Yeah, uh, that's it. So uh, Tate, in his preface to, to his King Lear, says he describes the play as um, a heap of jewels, unstrung and unpolished, yet dazzling in their disorder. So he's like, I've got individual chunks and I just need to put them in a nice <laughs> setting and put everything in the right order and it will be much better. And a lot of what they're, they're working against is um, the lack of morality that they perceive in Shakespeare's drama. So, you know, for us, I think for many of us, you know, sort of the point of King Lear is it's moral ambiguity, but they, they struggled with that immensely because theatre had to have a moral purpose. And so if you have mm -hmm. the good characters punished in the way that Shakespeare does, it's uh, not really very edifying for the audience at the time. And that's part of the reason, reason for the revision too. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, when I'm thinking of the restoration, I'll move a little bit beyond the restoration. Mm -hmm. I know we're in the late 18th century with your book, but mm -hmm. uh, when I think of the restoration writers, there was some racy stuff in there um, in yeah, those plays. Kind of, um, yeah, I think there's sort of a bit of a discrepancy between comedy and tragedy, and that comedy was sort of mostly where the racy stuff happened, and tragedy was supposed to have this edifying uh, aim. Um, and Charles is Charles II is very disingenuous about this in, in the royal proclamation, sort of allowing um, the theatre reopen and then allowing actresses on the stage because, you know, he says that one of the reasons to allow actresses is to avoid the um, the immorality of having boys acting women, um, which could potentially be an incitement to homosexuality within the audience. Um, so he wants to purge that and he wants to get rid of anything scurrilous and obscene. I mean, restoration drama places the actresses in some fairly dubious situations in terms of morality. They're often um, subjected to, to rape, to sexual harassment on stage. 
Um, so I don't know how, how genuine Charles's desires were as they were expressed in that proclamation, but you know, the women, the actresses, whatever they were acting in, they had a huge amount of agency that, that women performers hadn't, hadn't had before. Yes, and am I right in saying too that they may have hazarded off off stage uh, uh, advancement, sexual advancements from the king himself? Uh, Some of them certainly did. Yeah. So Nell Gwyn um, started out well, started as an orange seller in the theater, and then became an actress, and then became the mistress of the king. Um, yeah. Some actresses certainly did um, work as as um, were, become mistresses of the aristocracy or the royal family, but others did not. Others were often um, they needed to be respectably married, um, often to another actor in order to kind of maintain their reputations. But it was certainly a dangerous place for a single woman to be. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, well, uh, that's just, I, I can't wait to, to see this book and to see what you've come up with. Uh, what I want to do is kind of advance a little bit to, uh, <laughs> not that things you know are done and finished, uh, the, the book is not out yet, but you, mm -hmm. you are moving into this regional theater scene. And I'm very interested in this because I have an interest in 19th century, um, the, uh, the, the uh, theater circuit in 19th century America mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how uh, these things managed to survive in times when transportation was not that easy and yeah. setting all of this up they had you know uh when you see the what's left over of the images and pictures of this uh stage they they really went in for costumes and mm -hmm. sets and that sort of thing so they have to move from town to town place to place be mobile like uh uh, like the court, uh, the theater companies in Shakespeare's time when yeah, they did yeah. court plays at various uh, venues. Uh, and so are we going to be looking into that uh, in your future research yeah. or when we see it? I mean, what I found is that um, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a, there are various types of regional theater, actually. And actually, maybe before I talk about that, I'll just talk about I often, I think today I'm using the term regional and provincial somewhat interchangeably, uh -huh. but at some point I decided I wanted to stick with regional, um, mostly because provincial has such pejorative undertones, I think. And so I was sort of trying to find a way around that, but you know, all of the theater history today talks, largely talks about provincial theater history, but you know, yeah. what I mean is, you know, things, things that are happening outside London, often in, you know, very large towns that are yeah. quite sophisticated in themselves, but yep. yeah. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different types of thing going on. So you have these these circuits, then you have the you have these strolling companies who are the sort of quite down at heel ones who would have a very limited amount of um, costumes and props, and that's the kind of company that is depicted in Hogarth's uh, engraving, um, the strolling actresses dressing in a barn from 1737, where they. They didn't really have a lot and you know they're sort of getting dressed in, in, in a barn to put on this performance somewhere pretty low key. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of memoirs of actors sort of traipsing around the countryside. A lot later Elizabeth Inchbold who was started out as a strolling player as well, um, she kept accounts of sort of how many how many shoe repairs she had to do. <laughs> she got through a huge amount of shoe leather just because she was constantly walking. Um, and then there's sort of more established things. So um, from this, from 1768 onwards, we get we start to get theatres royal being set up in various cities around um, around Britain. Um, so in Bath, Bristol, York, these sort of slowly gain pace, and um, they often had a fixed company that would only act there. So they're not necessarily on a circuit. They they might be like the York Theatre Royal was on a circuit, but not all of them were. And so that is something that's it, that's much more approaching London and its level of sophistication because it's much more fixed and they have a bigger budget for props and scenery and costume and so on and they're not moving things around quite as much. Yeah, I have so many questions, but it, these uh, performances we think of Shakespearean performance in Shakespeare's period as being uh, afternoon in the public mm -hmm. theater, but I I'm assuming that these performances were at night is at, and so what would a uh, let's go for a week at um, uh, uh, Bath, Bristol. Uh, what sorts of plays would people see? Would there be a play every night? Would there uh, would this theaters be filled? That sort of thing. What's what sort yeah, of public response? Great question. Yeah, we have quite good records for different periods of the the Bath and Bristol theater. So I think um, it, you know it was a, a fixed company that is working on a repertory system. So they have to be ready to perform a large number of plays at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. If it was a sort of new play or a revival, they would do it for a few nights. Um, three nights was considered a good run. Nine nights was considered very good. 
And so some really successful plays, especially new ones, had those long runs, but otherwise they were sort of bouncing back and forth between different things. Um, I think at this point, most performers have one warp, as they called it. So they were either comic actors or tragic actors, um, and they don't tend to mix. And so if you're then interspersing comedy and tragedy, then that is a way for sort of giving some of the tragic stars a rest or the comic stars a rest because you're not mm. necessarily performing every night. Um, there's also the, the system that arises in the 18th century of the kind of the, the multiple events on the playbill. So there's a main piece every night, which would likely be, you know, a five act tragedy or a, a large comedy. And then there's an after piece afterwards, which could be a farce or a short uh, musical entertainment. And there is entre-act dancing. So some kind of song and dance between most of the acts. There's a lot of different things going on. So these yeah. could be long <laughs> evenings. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so mat matinees. Did, uh, was, was there a tradition of matinees afternoon? No, I don't think till then. I think that came in in the 19th century. So they're really, they're really sort of, I believe, starting around six, there may have been some flexibility on that. They had to start relatively early because, you know, some of these evenings could be four or five more hours long because there's so many different parts to them. Um, but also they had this concept of half price tickets. So which, you know, people, including Garrick, tried to get rid of at various times and, and always failed. Yeah. There was a riot when Garrick tried to abolish this. So you could come after the third act of the main play, pay half price and stay for the rest. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is interesting for all sorts of reasons, but one of the reasons is that, you know, we assume we see, oh, there are huge takings on this night when Hamlet was played. Mm -hmm. We assume that all those people came to see Hamlet, but we don't actually know. Maybe they came to see, you know, whatever spectacular afterpiece or pantomime was following Hamlet. So, it, it, you know, it's hard to separate out what was actually drawing the crowds and whether it was Shakespeare or whether it was something else. Well, it could easily have been uh, Siddons uh, mm -hmm. drawing yes, the crowd yes, uh, because of, yeah. I, I know she was famous for her Lady Macbeth. Mm -hmm. And so uh, very similar to a, a, a movie uh, star now. Some people go to the movie because it's an action film or yeah. something and, or because they want to see their favorite actor or one of their favorite actors act. But these, these would be, uh, I think, huge. The big name actors would be huge draws uh, what are, are we talking about venues in the regions there that are comparable in size and uh, let's say elegance? I, I'm not sure, I, uh, you know, in, in architecture to the big, uh, what we would see as West End theaters in London, would, would they be yeah, comparable? I think there's, there's a lot of variation. So something like um, the Theatre Royal in, in Bristol, that was apparently modeled on Garrick's Drury Lane and it, it was pretty nice inside. And then other places were much more ad hoc and then you know there's still a lot of performance happening in in yards barns uh town halls assembly rooms much more impromptu especially those companies that toured on circuits so that they were not necessarily using purpose-built theaters but the theaters royal you know they were smaller in scale but the idea was that they were supposed to attract you know the great and the good of the town and, and be sort of elegant places for mm. uh, welcoming audience members uh, w would they be? Uh, would there be a kind of class structure like you would see in the London theaters, where you have the uh, higher price boxes, and and then you have uh, what gallery and pit that sort of thing? Would it be? Yeah, exactly. So way? they're all they're all um, mostly those sort of purpose built theaters follow that model of um, box pit and gallery. So the boxes are the most expensive um, seats, and then the pit is um, the area in front of the stage, which had benches which um, was, you know, not, it was quite rowdy or it could be quite rowdy, yeah. but not super cheap. And then the galleries uh, tended to be higher up and often servants would be up there. That's, that's how it works. Yeah. And we, we have to envision a theater, even though they're, they're, you're not, you're not dealing with people who are sitting quietly like we would. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they are coming in and out. I think they felt free if they felt like they wanted to go get a pint or whatnot. I, you know, they could go out and do it anytime they wanted to, uh, particularly with the freedom in the boxes, the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and we see this in our reading and also in films and so forth. You might pop in and then pop out. And then you're watching, just like in, uh, Ham in Hamlet, you're watching mm -hmm. people watch a play. There's Absolutely. a social yeah. scene there. And uh, who, whoever the the uh, are considered the aristocrats or the big big name people, you're watching to make to see how they respond to something on the stage. So there's drama within the drama mm -hmm. in, in the crowd, right? Yeah. So Peeps is very good is very good for this. I mean, I think 
you know, the, the theatre going part of Peeps is such a small part of the diary and we, he was such a, a unique person, we sort of need to be a bit careful about taking him as representative of all restoration theatre goers, but he's just so quotable and so fun, so he has lots of anecdotes about, you know, I saw Lady So-and-so and feasted my eyes on her instead of on the performance, or I went backstage and talked to the actresses, I mean there's a sense of ownership that, you know, you could circulate backstage until Garrick banned that um, much later. Um, and also the, the key thing is, is that the auditorium is light. And I think that makes a huge difference because they don't have um, very efficient ways of dimming the light in the house um, because it's all lit by candles. So everyone can see everyone else. And that I think encourages people to, to, to look at what else is going on. I mean, there's occasionally dueling breaking out. There are obviously um, flirt, there's flirting going on, sex workers looking for customers, orange, orange women selling oranges and, you know, whatever else you can think of. And it would really depend. The audience is um, often creating a spectacle that is as interesting as what's happening on stage. Yeah. Well, the, it, the theater really did sen seem to flourish uh, under, uh, well, first Garrick and then Kimball when it uh, was managed well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, could you uh, talk about that a bit? The management mm. of the theater, how, because it's so important, you know, you have to keep the uh, structure uh, oper yeah. operational. And also, I, I'm assuming that there were shareholders in the theater, that there was, uh, what types of ownership? How did, yeah. the, how did the theater, uh, let's say a, a set venue like Jury Lane or, or Covent Garden, how did it maintain itself over these kind of long stretches? Yeah, so Garrick, um, Garrick was both proprietor and manager. Sometimes, the proprietor could be sort of the money, but very hands off. I and mean, he shared that partnership with James Lacey and they had an agreement that um, Garrick would manage all the stage business and Lacey would just do the finances basically. Um, and when uh, Kemble bought into theatre management, so he was manager of Drury Lane, um, the proprietor at that point was um, Richard Brinsley Sheridan. And there's been you know, a lot of debate about what precisely their responsibilities were. Sheridan was often in Parliament. <laughs> he was an MP, yeah. often given, um, giving parliamentary speeches and also writing plays. Um, but he was very invested in the day-to-day -day, day -day running of the theatre. But Kemble very much was the person who picked the repertoire and who cast the plays and decided, you know, which vehicle for himself or for his sister he was going to put on at any given time. And yeah, so he, he, he was still... He was yes. still always answerable to, to Sheridan, um, who, and the one thing that Kemble always refused to do was, um, was purchase new plays. <laughs> he, he was like, I don't, I'm not really interested in the new stuff. I just want to stick with these, with the greats. I want to do Shakespeare. And, you know, if, if Sheridan made him put on a new play, then he probably would. But otherwise, he was not that into new, encouraging new writing. And then when he bought into Covent Garden, he owned a one-sixth share so he's a sort of partial shareholder but he has the role of manager and he's also drawing a salary for being manager um and so you know sometimes the, the other shareholders or proprietors were more hands-on sometimes they were more hands-off and i think one of the things that garrick did that campbell continued um garrick was not the first person to be both an actor and a manager but i think you know having been an actor and um, I'm not afraid to say an egomaniac. I think <laughs> Garrett gets a lot of uh, attention that maybe is not always well deserved. I think he really wanted to try and put the focus on the actors and sort of try and um, keep the audience in check a little bit more. And so he did enact a number of reforms that tried to make the theatre a bit more respectable. So he banned this practice of audience members going backstage. Uh, he banned um, uh, this is Kim, Kim, Kimball. We're this talking. is Garrick. 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 Yeah. Garrick. It starts with Garrick. Yes. Uh, more, yes. He banned more audience members yes. sitting on the stage, which is something that had gone back, you know, to the early modern theatres. Um, and he tried to introduce uh, to, to get rid of the half price tickets and failed. So he's really trying to sort of to put the focus on the performers and to have them taken seriously as professionals. I think what you see in something like Peeps's diary is this, and, and in the proclamations by Charles II that reopened the theatre is really the sense that, you know, the actors are the servants of the public and that the public therefore have the right to interrupt the performance or to go mm. backstage or to throw fruit or whatever it might be. Whereas with Garrick and then later with Kemble, we're working towards acting as a profession that is to be respected um, and that people should be paying attention to what is happening on the stage. Uh, that's, there's so much there and uh, I'm, well, I, I, in a, just a flurry of questions that I have about 
about this. Um, you know, we kind of think of these things as institutions, but they were run day to day. You, you have these uh, managers who could step on stage and act at any time. But the big question I've had, and this is in the Shakespearean period too, is was there any sense of there being a, a director? Would uh, Garrick or Kimball have also been, as in our modern view, would they have directed plays? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, Garrick maybe experimented with this a bit. I mean, he was mostly interested in himself and like what, what he was <laughs> doing, but obviously he also staged plays that he was not in. Um, but in Garrick's day, there's very little in the way of collaborative rehearsal. So they're not really rehearsing together. By Kemble's time, that's happening a bit more and Kemble was much more insistent on making that happen. And I think one of the things I try to argue in the book is that Kemble is, you know, in a sense, the first modern director in a way, in part because he really had a, a comprehensive vision of the entirety of the production that he was putting on. So he thought very carefully about the visual effects, the music, the lighting. He was really adept at using, you know, tons of supernumeraries to fill the stage. Um, and he has, his prompt books have these elaborate diagrams of the blocking and where, you know, not actually not so much the blocking, but where everyone is standing in the key yeah, scenes yeah. to really create a visual picture. So yeah, he's certainly yeah. moving towards that that kind of, of level of, of direction that we would be that we see more in the 19th century and that we're more, we're more familiar with now. Okay, because I just see it as being potentially chaotic and you know you have some characters in the Shakespeare productions but other other plays there too. There, there's a, a fairly large cast. And mm -hmm. I, I just wondered how you even begin, you know, where, where, where how, how are things blocked? If it's uh, the instinct of an actor, an actor just comes, yeah. uh, just learns to do things a certain way and be standing at a certain place at a certain time. Well, yeah, one of the things we do know is that, you know, there were sort of um, accepted interpretations of roles and that you were expected to follow your predecessors interpretations of mm -hmm. those roles. So I think, I mean, my sense is that a lot of actors, yes, there, there is the scope for some, putting some individual touches there, but a lot of them, you know, they had seen Macbeth acted by somebody else and then they recreate that, you know, that, that is Macbeth. They recreate those movements and the blocking and the gestures and, and whatever. I mean, there's a sense of ownership in that often actors can't take on new roles until the previous owner of the role has retired. And so this was a problem actually for Kemble because um, Siddons, as you mentioned, was a very famous Lady Macbeth and had been acting it for a long time. But Kemble had to wait until um, some of the other actors, um, mostly William Smith had retired in order to be able to take on the role of, of Macbeth opposite his sister. And then they became very famous acting that together. So there's that ownership. Um, you know, another anecdote I can tell you about Macbeth is that when um, Siddons first started to act it, she wanted to put down the candle in the hand washing scene, which seems kind of obvious because if you're going to mime hand washing, you can't be holding a candle. But her predecessor, Hannah Pritchard, who I've written a lot about and who was, was a, an amazing actress in her own right, um, who played Lady Macbeth opposite Garrick's Macbeth, she never put the candle down. And Sheridan came into her dressing room and said, sort of, are you mad? You can't possibly do this. You're going to upset the whole theater. And then, you know, Siddons quite sort of uh, triumphantly records that you know actually it was very well received and from that moment on nobody ever put <laughs> nobody ever held the candle again and sort of quite satisfied about it but yes there's like definitely expectations that you will follow previous practice okay so an actor in training let's think of people we've maybe never heard of or people or or Siddons when she is uh, gaining her experience would be watching would be attending plays themselves or somehow connected where they can watch a, an actor play a role and study it that way. Yeah, I mean, Siddons and Campbell growing up in the theater, you know, they would have been around performances all the time. They would have seen their father's company um, performing Macbeth and they would, you know, have that, those memories to work with, I think. And Siddons and Campbell also to a sort of the, the part of the, the first generation of actors to really think about the interpretation of the role, like very much based on the text, you know, Campbell, was made very careful study of the text, partly for acting purposes and partly for his directing purposes. And Siddons does the same, like a lot of her um, reminiscences are about reading Lady Macbeth and how she sort of worked her, her way through the role and how she came up with her own interpretation. And that was sort of what led to her making changes that might've been subtle at first and then later became a bit more pronounced, I think. 
Okay, so we're looking at a, a period where people feel very free to adapt Shakespeare to whatever mm -hmm. their tastes are. But uh, I, I'm wondering if some of the same rules, though, did, I mean, at one point, you lose the sense of authenticity. If you wander mm -hmm. away from the uh, text, I think in modern, what we consider the modern standard is you can change a lot, but mm -hmm. you can't add, uh, you can't add too much to the yeah. Shakespearean language. You can cut the Shakespearean language, but you don't change the Shakespearean language. I wonder if that standard was in place for uh, those per performances in uh, <laughs> mid to late to uh, 18th century to early 19th century. That's a very good question. I think, you know, they had a very loose understanding of what Shakespeare was, but I think possibly the most important thing here is that a lot of those adaptations from the restoration actually were still being performed by Siddons and Campbell a hundred years later. And they were not um, restored until 1838. You know, the full version was not restored until 1838. So both Garrick and Campbell made some changes and sort of reinserted re some of the Shakespearean language, but the plot was basically the same. You know, we still have the, the love story between Cordelia and Edgar, and we have, um, you know, the, the, the good characters surviving at the end. The same with Macbeth. They're working it with Davenant's version of Macbeth, which has come to them through Garrick. Garrick has made some changes, including adding a huge death speech for himself, <laughs> just so he can showcase his skill in, in death scenes. And, and that's what they're, they're, what Sims and Campbell are working with, you know, 100 years later after the original adaptation. Wow. So a, a parallel tradition develops uh, beside Shakespeare. Yeah. And Campbell makes his own adaptations, actually. I mean, he he's not, I mean, a lot of what he's doing in his versions is restoring some of the Shakespearean text that has been lost, but he certainly puts his own spin on things and cuts cuts passages and rearranges things. He does that with his Coriolanus, with the Tempest and with various plays, Henry VIII. Um, just thinking about the way that he wants to present them in the theatre that he has now, which was very different from Shakespeare's theatre and very different from the Restoration Theatre too. I mean, much larger, I think, at this point. Yeah, and I'm thinking that the Restoration Theatre was a little bit more of an aristocratic and, mm -hmm. uh, up, uh, you know, citizens, higher level citizen scene, uh, not nearly as big as uh, things, I see things opening up uh, greatly in the 18th century. Uh, now, I'm wondering, though, uh, would, would you, okay, so you have uh, a major theater in London and a major theater scene, but at the same time, those regional theaters are showing plays and mm -hmm. you need, you need actors. You, you can mm -hmm. use the same plays, but you can't use the same actors. Right. So yeah. there, there must've been in those regional theaters, some people who had kind of local fame, you know, like the- uh, Yeah, you know. absolutely. No, I think that's definitely true. There are some sort of local stars. And then we also have, I mean, it, they're, they're harder to document, but yes, they're there. And then we also have the, the London performers going on tour to the regions. Yeah. And actually, I think one of the things about this somewhat uniform production style is that, you know, if you're Sarah Siddons going to perform Lady Macbeth in Cheltenham with a company that you've never worked with before, <laughs> if everybody is doing like a fairly standard version of Macbeth and you're not doing any rehearsals, like that's gonna <laughs> save you some headaches, right? Yeah. So I think that's also part of it because often, you know, these stars were kind of inserted into companies that they've never worked with before. And Siddons often has some fairly snippy comments <laughs> in her letters about how she had to t play with this company who were terrible and nobody knew their lines and would, they were so unprofessional and etc. So they would just go in, Siddons would just go in and plug herself in to an existing company that was playing basically that one theater and yeah. she would and whoever was playing Lady Macbeth would have was to surrender, like, yeah, and, surrender the stage of, to her. That would be and, pretty tough, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, but, you know, that, that's, that makes complete sense to me. Uh, there are some other things I want to talk about, some uh, yeah. kind of key words. And you've done some work on what's called uh, emotional contagion. Mm -hmm. And please tell us uh, more about emotional contagion. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is sort of um, building on the idea that I mentioned before of, of the theater being light um, and everybody being able to see each other and what difference that might make to a performance. I mean, there's, there's many facets to it, but I think, you know, the, the basic premise is that, um, and, you know, others have written about this other than me. So Bruce McConaughey is one of them and uh, Susan Bennett, people who've worked on audiences, um, that, you know, in a, in a, light, in a lit theatre, when you can see other people's facial expressions, emotion is going to spread 
much more easily. I mean, we all know that it spreads pretty easily in the dark anyway, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had that experience of being in a theater and seeing everybody crying and then suddenly finding yourself crying or whatever. But um, in a lighted theater, I think it, it, it spreads more quickly because of that visibility. Um, but also in the age of sensibility, as the 18th century was, when people are very invested in portraying an emotional response to culture, literature, theater, life, um, because that is a way of proclaiming your own moral status, right? Can you react empathetically to the woes that you're seeing on stage? That demonstrates that you're a good person. Um, so there becomes this sort of ambiguity about emotional contagion in that, you know, that emotions are spreading around the playhouse, but um, are they actually genuine or are people performing them because they feel like they need to have a particular reaction? A dem demonstrative. Yes. Uh, yes. So the uh, they need uh, to cry to prove that they're you know they need to cry at the ending of King Lear even though it's now happy uh, to show that they are um, you know that they're responding to the the moral the moral that 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 play is now teaching. Uh, I I think I was drawn to that particular key term, uh, emotional contagion, because of. Uh, and for any viewers who uh, see this a year or two from now, we mm -hmm. have uh, we are on the tail end of a pandemic that included lockdowns right. when we were isolated from uh, all kinds of public activity, you know, whether it's uh, going to the uh, down to the restaurant or bar or pub or uh, even uh, some, but one of the big things was theater. Mm -hmm. And I don't I think almost all of us uh, were we were surprised at how uh, at how that affected us, how much it affected us and how much we took this for granted being able to e even go to a movie theater with people you've yeah. never seen before, but just going yeah. out and being with people in public. Uh, I, I, I was overwhelmed by that. And there was a kind of, uh, I don't know, what the reverse term would be to emotional contagion. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah. So one thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, obviously with the outdoor playing spaces in, in Shakespeare's time, this is a concept um, in Shakespeare's time. And also there is literal contagion, as we know, in the Shakespearean yeah. theatre, right, with periods of plague and so on. And this sometimes still happens in the, the restoration theatre as well, that theatres get closed for, for disease outbreaks. Um, so people like uh, Dowd Chalk and Mary Floyd Wilson have written about the, the emotional contagion in the early modern theatre. So it's a continuation of that too. But I think there must be some really interesting work to be done on all of the, the screenings and the streamings that we watched during lockdown. So the NT Live Shakespeare's and Shakespeare's Globe and all of those things that we watched on our own or with one or two other people and how that might have engendered a different emotional response. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even, uh, even uh, well, uh, we're back, we're back face to face, and I, I will show clips in class. Mm -hmm. But for uh, two years, I was showing, I was putting the clips up on uh, our Google right. Classroom or whatnot. Right. And I, I had no idea what the response was from from the students and so we still have that available so if a student let's say misses class they, yeah. they can go see whatever we were uh, watching that day you know whatever yeah. uh, 20 minute clip i put up and uh but to have students in the class and to watch it with and to spend class time doing that yeah uh, it, it's just it just is amazing it's it's a different thing yeah absolutely and i think you know my colleagues who teach film i'm in a department that teaches literature drama and theater and, and cultural studies and so my, my colleagues who teach film, I think, have noted a, obviously a real shift from having to have screenings of particular films um, that they were covering in their classes and then discuss them in class to now having the students watch those films on their own and then come to class to discuss them. And I think, you know, that there's, a, there's something different going on when you don't have the communal experience of watching together. It really is something uh, different. And there's certain things that are sort of fun to watch, you know. Uh, I don't know, just, just at home, you know, with uh, family or or just by yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I, I certainly did. I, I have and I still mm, have not been able to make it back out to the theater uh, yet, but uh, soon. And uh, uh, let's move on to uh, some other things that uh, you have worked on in the past. And I'm going through 
uh, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're talking, you're, you are doing uh, gender, you're doing uh, mm -hmm. fem feminist research, yeah. you're showing yeah. periods in, and I wanted to spend some more time, I think, on, on this, and this, uh, this the, the way women in entertainment, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any of this in Shakespeare's time, or very little, you know, uh, but in the Restoration 18th century, we're talking about uh, King Charles. But mm -hmm. as we move through the 18th century, women having, having to negotiate, to mediate, to build careers, to survive yeah. in this yeah. still extremely male-driven uh, industry, yeah. which just like any other uh, industry. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are so many different strategies for doing that. So I think... Siddons herself, her marriage was not a particularly happy one. She married this actor, William Siddons, who was a lot older than her. And, you know, he was a sort of bit part actor and continued acting for a bit, but then sort of became her full-time manager um, and often squandered her money, I think. Um, yeah, so she sort of, she uses this as a way of kind of keeping herself respectable because he's the one that does all the negotiations. You know, she's going to go to Edinburgh and perform for a week. He's the one that's writing back and forth with the manager Jackson at Edinburgh and agreeing on the terms because it's too vulgar for women to talk about money. Mm. Um, but that could have a downside in that, you know, he often <laughs> apparently mismanaged her money and invested it in places that it maybe didn't belong. Yeah. So stories <laughs> I mean, there are many other examples so Catherine Clive who was a, a contemporary of Garrick's um, used the press quite uh, effectively to make clear the way that she was being treated by the managers and you know and to sort of stake her claim to being treated fairly and to point out um, the way that that Garrick's sexism might work um, and it was often, it's come up a lot for me in terms of thinking about women theatre managers and why there aren't very many of them. I mean, they're, they're not very many in London, they're actually a lot outside London. But part of this is about the fact that if you have money as a woman, it's controlled by your husband. And so if, if you're entering into a partnership with, with a male theatre manager to own part of the theatre, that person is, that male theatre manager is negotiating with your husband, who they may or may not approve of or get on with or they may be concerned that he's going to run off with the money so it's it's, it's not really about you as a woman theatre manager I think a lot of the women theatre managers were more independent and sort of you know unmarried or widowed or whatever and this is something that um Elizabeth Inchbold who was not a manager but she was an actress um and then later a playwright and also a critic she wrote um a lot of dramatic criticism she was married to an actor very early on and he was much older than her and he died and she chose never to remarry um, you know, so she sort of, she had the respectability that being a widow gave her. Mm -hmm. She lost a little bit of the protection um, that being married might have given her, but she had, you know, she was friends with Kemble. She had many friends in the industry, but she kept the freedom. She kept the freedom then to be able to do what she wanted with her money and sort of channel her energies where she wanted to channel them. Yeah, I'm wondering if women on stage in particular, uh, that they, they had some type, some freedoms to do things that they would not have in the normal uh, world. Mm -hmm. And that that uh, wasn't in, in a way contagious that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. women who went to see the plays would go, oh, so a woman can be like this, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, setting a fashion of sorts or or opening up the boundaries of what you're, um, how you can express yourself in real life. Yeah, I mean, there were actresses who were literal <laughs> trendsetters too. I mean, Frances Abington, who was another actress under Garrick and then contemporary of, of Siddons, that, you know, there's a fashion for what became known, known as the Abington cap. She, you know, popularized this particular piece of headwear. So there's that kind of thing going on. But I think also, um, you know, and I think scholars have, have argued that there is much more performance by women going on in the early modern theater than we've previously been aware of. And that work is, I think, really valuable and important. Um, so I just want to mention it, but I think seeing, seeing women on stage in the London public theatres on a routine regular basis must have meant something to the women and the men in the audience and we certainly have evidence that some of the male actors were felt very threatened <laughs> by the women you know that they were more of a draw that they were being sidelined um yeah well that's right if a, if you have someone who's in one of what we would now consider the professions you know whether or not it's uh uh being a scrivener or or uh, a lawyer of some type uh or uh, some sort of uh 
you know, the men at work, right? They're, they're not in competition with women in the workplace, but on mm -hmm. the stage, they are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that sometimes the, I mean, I think sometimes the actresses were earning more. I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, pay discrepancy that women are underpaid, but by the citizens this time, you know, she's certainly earning a lot um, and is often the highest paid member of the company, despite whatever male actors might be in it. Yeah, well, I'm also interested, and this is something I have not uh, prepared for, but uh, it's brought up a question in my mind, mm. what happens, uh, the industry, the acting industry, the film industry, uh, wh whatever century that we're, we're in, is particularly hard on women as they age, mm -hmm. uh, and, and roles that are powerful. Now, some of that has changed in recent time, mm -hmm. and we do have these uh, you know, we, we could reel off many names, but in the 18th century, uh, Siddons uh, had a very long career in a time mm -hmm. when I think that perhaps the uh, women who were actors were mm -hmm. highly disposable, right? Because mm -hmm. most of the roles are for younger, attractive women and, uh, or, or boys originally maybe, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I think one of the things with somebody of the magnitude of Siddons is that she just kept playing the roles. I mean, she she never did sort of ingenue roles or the young female leads, really. Um, she dropped those fairly quickly. And so things like the sort of iconic, um, powerful roles like Lady Macbeth, Constance in King John, Queen Catherine in Henry VIII, and a lot of very 18th century repertoire, she kept playing them beyond the time that she'd aged <laughs> out of them. Um, in a way that I think I find quite empowering. And that doesn't mean that she wasn't subjected to criticism for doing that. So there's, you know, I think there's still a double standard in that um, a woman's age and uh, physical appearance will be commented on by the press a lot more than a male actor's would be. So towards the end of her career, there are, there are people commenting on the fact that she's, she's grown very fat and she needs an attendant to help her out of her chair if she sits on a throne and things like that. Um, but, you know, she's still acting multiple times a week. Um, and I think it, that's kind of interesting to me that if you make your name in these in that particular line of roles early on, you don't necessarily need to to change. There's actually um, a wonderful scholar named Nevena Martinovic, who's currently finishing a, a book project on women, aging women actresses in the 18th century and how they were considered. So that's going to, I think, add an, a lot of new light to that question. And one other thing I think I should mention about the women on the stage, which again is something someone else is working on. Um, Ch Chelsea Phillips has just published a wonderful book about actresses and pregnancy in the 18th century, which includes Siddons and Dorothy Jordan, yeah. another person I'm very, very interested in, both of whom had a lot of children and a lot of pregnancies. <laughs> so how does that impact um, their, their physical abilities to perform at any given time, their repertoire? I mean, it, it's a really fascinating question. Yeah, well, yeah, of course, people, you know, I would thank you for bringing that to uh, my attention, to our attention. Oh, cool. yeah. uh, the, um, uh, it, it's something that's interested me uh, in Hamlet, how uh, Hamlet uh, is in famous film productions, 20th century film productions that is played typically by about a 40 year old man, whether mm -hmm, it's Olivier mm -hmm. or Branagh or um, Mel Gibson, you know, if we think mm -hmm. of the famous film productions. And uh, he's in, still in in school. He could be a graduate student, but he's no. He's right. getting he's getting yeah. on a bit to be a uh, a grad student, uh, <laughs> in uh, yeah. oh, whatever uh, Wittenberg. But uh, <laughs> uh, people read a lot into that line about him being fat and scant of breath. I think. I mean, it doesn't yeah, necessarily yes. mean that he's old, but somehow it's always translated that way. And maybe no. this brings us to to Siddons's Hamlet too. I mean, I can talk a bit about that if you like. Oh you yes, that's right. Also acted that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have I have a note here to do just that because she is famous also for playing Hamlet. Yes, yeah. I mean, this is one of the points of connection I found between her and Kemble when they didn't act together on stage, but they acted the same part separately at different times. <laughs> um, so Siddons, Siddons acted Hamlet before Kemble did, um, and he acted in the provinces before they went to London. He was her Laertes. So I think that's a, a nice uh, way of showing their status at the time. Um, yeah, so she acted it in various um, regional towns before she became a London star. And then she revived it and then did a couple of performances in Dublin. So the interesting thing about it is that she never did it on the London stage, um, possibly because 
by, by the, because it was her brother's first London role. And so he very quickly became known as Hamlet. Maybe she didn't want to compete with him. Maybe she thought it was more risky doing that kind of uh, cross-gender role in uh, London compared to outside London. I mean, she was not an actress who was good in, who was famous or popular in breaches parts, you know, the sort of the Shakespearean um, boy, heroine, boy heroines and so on. Um, yeah, so there's just some very interesting layers to, to that that I've been trying to unpick a little bit. Yeah, Do you, are, are there any other uh, cross-gendered cross uh, examples that uh, you've run across of uh, either way, uh, uh, male actors, playing or or younger actors playing women i i i've not seen it yeah uh, it, it, she's exceptional it seems to me and, so and, actually um in the provinces you often get women playing male roles and this is something i'm wanting to dig deeper into so we know that in various companies there are you know there's a sort of lead woman who often ends up playing a lot of the male roles and often this is because the companies are smaller and they're mm. doing Shakespeare plays and they don't have enough people. So they have to put some of the women into the male roles. But, you know, you would think that they would maybe put them in the sort of more minor roles. But in fact, there's often uh, women playing major, uh, major Shakespeare male parts too. So there's examples of that. And there seems to have been a lot more flexibility on that and on many things, I think, um, in the regions compared to in London. Yeah. Uh, it's just fascinating stuff. And there's, it's so rich. Uh, I, if someone from my background is a little bit jealous because you do get to research in an area that uh, is, is more, more plentiful than uh, sometimes we run out of uh, steam in our research mm -hmm. in the 16th century and the Elizabethan period in particular, because it, so you write records are lost or whatnot. Right. But uh, I think even when you're in the 18th century, you're going, oh, if we just knew a little bit more, you know, if this guy had just saved his a whatever uh, a, a book of accounts you know the yeah. whoever the henslow uh is in uh, the 18th century if we just had more we would know so much more we know we know too much in the 18th century in a way too but <laughs> also what we know is very uneven and i think this has been one of the really interesting aspects of doing this regional theater research which has been Largely, I've been going to um, different towns in the UK and um, going to regional archives, and that might be in the in the city library or it might be in the public record office, the county record office. And what I find varies so wildly. <laughs> so I, my, my example of this is that if you go to the Liverpool City Library and ask them, you know, for all of the Liverpool Theatre Royal playbills for, you know, for the 18th century, they'll bring you three bound volumes. And if you go to Manchester and ask for the same thing, they will bring you 33 bound volumes of playbills. Ooh. And it's to do with, you know, Manchester Library has a very strong theatre collection. So it's to do with collecting practices. I think a lot of this regional stuff was not deemed to be important at various points. I've often come across, you know, documents that were destroyed in enemy action in World War II and the archive was bombed. Things that, you know, often I go there and there's something in the catalogue and they just can't find it because nobody's asked for it for years. So piecing together this history of regional theatre when the materials are so um like so varied like the, the extent of the material is so varied has actually been a challenge an interesting one but it's definitely a challenge and I have I can't even tell you how many thousands and thousands of photographs on my hard drive of documents and you know just trying to make sense of it all is uh, it, that's that's going to be some work but I've, I've missed the archive so much during the pandemic I can't wait to get back and start digging a bit more. Well, I wanted to go into your research methodology for those mm -hmm. of us who are working scholars or are working to be to become working scholars uh, that well, what you have said is, is there's too much and then there are gaps in in the too much, which yeah. in, in both cases can be uh, confounding. Uh, there's a pandemic that keeps you from being able to travel and use yeah. uh, archives and uh, you, and we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about your role as an administrator uh, bef mm -hmm. before we finish. But right now, as a researcher, so the, the, you do get access. To, there is a lot more now that you can get digital access to. And you, mm -hmm. get, you get search capability, which is very helpful if the database is set up correctly. Yeah. And uh, but if you're going to regional theaters, you're like you're not at the National Archives. You're not at the uh, London Metropolitan archives uh you're not 
necessarily at the big libraries, you know, the yeah. Oxford, uh, the Bodleian or, or whatnot. You're, you're in towns and it could it's be- a very different kettle of fish, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I remember looking for some, uh, I was, <laughs> when I was in graduate school, we were looking for some letters that the poet Ezra Pound, I was just a friend of mine was a, a, interested in Ezra Pound. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ezra Pound gave instructions to this guy named Thomas Carter, I think is his name, on how to set up a journal. And he set up a mm -hmm. poetry journal. But anyway, we, we wanted to find those letters because it's a, a great or a well-known poet explaining to a younger fellow how to set up a poetry journal. We thought mm -hmm. that would be an interesting little thing to yeah. publish. And, uh, and we looked at, uh, at we went uh, down uh, kind of uh, through Virginia and finally found these letters at a community college. And it's a, a two year school yeah. li library. And um, our, our American viewers will remember younger Andy, oh, Andy of Mayberry, but mm -hmm. that's how, that's what the librarian, he was this gentleman who looked like he just stepped off of his tractor and walked into uh, you know, his part-time job as a librarian. And we started asking about this and he said, well, where are you fellows from? And we told mm -hmm. him so forth. And he walked right back there, picked them up and handed it to us. He, he said, you can wow. make, you, you can, you can make copies of these. We'll, uh, we'll allow it. But yeah. uh, he, he really played dumb at first, but it was, it was just a wonderful Very experience. I, yeah. I may have gone on too long about that, but you, you meet these people in, in these circumstances and these collections. Mm -hmm. And it, it just amazes me where things end up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of um, regional theatre material in the big archives in the US, you know, the Folger Harvard Theatre Collection, the Huntington and so on. But, you know, that's all pretty well known and I've been trying to turn up what else there might be. So yeah, the, the, the local record offices, it's a different kind of research. I think, um, you know, I try to figure out as much as possible in advance what they have, but I can, and you know, but I can never be totally sure that I might, that, you know, A, that they're actually gonna be able to find it or B, that <laughs> it's there, or, you know, there might be completely different things. Um, and the, the librarians and archivists are wonderful, but they are just overworked. I mean, you know, budget cuts um, under the current oh. government and yeah, it, it's really unsustainable. And most of what they are doing actually, in my experience is helping um, people researching their family history, which is great. Like that's a service to the local community, but it leads like that is often their, their research expertise. So it leads to a very particular type of researching, which is actually often very useful to me. But I've been working with a lot of different kinds of documents that I've never <laughs> interacted with before. So I find a lot of playbills um, in these archives and they, there are a lot of those in the, in the major libraries too but also some kind of financial documents to do with, you know, shareholders and who owns what and wills and so on. There are occasionally account books of, of managers and yeah, property deeds and all kinds of, of different things like that. Yeah. So you do this type of ar archival research and I wanted uh, us, our uh, audience to, to know that and a deep archival research that is not, uh, it's not stuff that has necessarily been digitized, uh, not uh, available remotely. And yeah. uh, per, uh, how do you find time in your, your directing? Uh, you're in the graduate division at McGill and yeah. you're directing that in, in your department, right? It, it currently is that? Right now, yeah, I'm actually just finishing at the moment my three year term as director of graduate studies in the department. Yeah. <laughs> and two, two um, of the three years being uh, during uh, an unprecedented time. Yeah, <laughs> it's been interesting. I mean, I was actually supposed to do two years and then I ended up staying for a third year because I thought I hadn't got anything done because of COVID and then COVID didn't go anywhere. So, yeah. 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 Uh, but that has to keep you extremely busy. And uh, that would, uh, in normal times, would have would have been made it harder to get away yeah. uh, because most of what you're looking for is located somewhere in the UK. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I can, I can tell you, I mean, I had to think about this very pragmatically um, and actually as relevant to, um, to this as the director of graduate studies and the pandemic is, is the fact that I'm a parent. Um, so I have two kids who are four and the, the older one's going to turn nine this weekend. Um, so, I got a grant from SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, who is our wonderful 
governmental body that funds humanities research. We are so lucky. Um, many years ago now for this the, for the regional theatre project and I um, around the time my first son was born and then I, I started doing the research and I was able to do quite a lot of that on my first sabbatical so I have a lot of material gathered and then when I had my second child I sort of thought okay well you know I'm not really going to be able to travel while she's little so at that point I got invited to write the Siddons and Campbell book and it, I actually put the regional theatre project on hold to write that one because I knew it would be a more expedient book to write um, but it would go faster. It's, it's, I mean, there's a good amount of archival research in it, but there's there's less than for the regional theatre project. And so now that that book is is done, I'm at the point of picking up the regional theatre work again. But another thing that I've done actually is I've been lucky to work with some really incredible research assistants, and some of them have actually gone to UK archives for me and photographed things and um, brought back materials. And that's been a great way of doing it again with the funding that I had um, from Shirk. So I've been very lucky in that regard. Yeah. But I, you know, that's been, that was also very hard for me to delegate. It took me a while to get to that point because I, I love nothing more than, than poking around in an archive. <laughs> it's it's yeah. sad to send someone else. Yeah, there uh, is it's a strange uh, group of us who, who like it. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's not liked by everybody, but the, uh, yeah, I can see that there are some parallels between your own uh, career and some of these uh, women who you you have been researching in the yeah. 18th century. And we, we talked earlier about pregnancy, uh, having adult children myself, I can tell you that you do get your life back at yeah. one point. There's a feeling... <laughs> There's a feeling because let's see nine and four. So you you were yeah you had a six year old when you have two very young children. There's a feeling that this is it. Uh, yeah. That you you've you've fallen from the branch. All, all you're doing here is you're going to make sure that these these people stay alive and healthy and yeah. protect them. And uh, you know in my case I remember doing much of my writing and research at night. And mm -hmm. then you know with, when the kids came. Uh, I was exhausted, it, yeah. you know, after yeah. eight o'clock at night, I, you know, and that was my, um, you know, that, that was when the muse set in uh, yeah. before. And uh, so we, we know a lot about that, but then you're doing this as a woman uh, and fortunately in a, in a, an environment that's better yes than it was uh, 200 yes. years yes, ago i have it much much easier than my subjects that is for sure yeah uh but there's still expectations you know that, yeah. that you feel and, and still uh uh those those kinds of stresses and then you throw a, a, a pandemic on it too uh uh well and it hadn't and it hadn't quite gone away either you know mm -hmm. uh i yeah. just uh it's still it's still lingering you know I, i'm still yeah. We're still well, dealing with the effects and a lot of what I've been doing in the past couple of years is, you know, um, dealing with various issues that have come up for the graduate students that have been caused by the pandemic and, you know, there have been various crises, you know, and morale has been low at points, mental health has been an issue for, for many students yeah. and for many faculty members, so yeah, that, that was kind of full time. <laughs> yeah, well, I, just for the record, you know, I, I had a student uh, approached me after class recently, and uh, she was interested in getting involved with our literary society, which we mm -hmm. we really encourage. And it's sometimes hard to find people, you know, because they, they get busy with other things. And uh, and I said, well, just walk over here with me to uh, the you know English office. And we're going up the elevator, and she says, it's the first time I've been in this building. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're a third year student. How is this the first yeah. time you've been? In, in, yeah. And I realized, oh, she's been, you know, taking classes remotely. This is, yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, and just that experience of going into the English office and meeting, yeah. you know, our very wonderful staff there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she was not permitted that along with her colleagues, you know, her, her friends and, mm -hmm. and those two particular years. And then, uh, yeah, we could go on and on talking about that. But mm -hmm. you maintained your graduate program, so yes. yeah. there. Uh, yeah. We had a lot of deferrals <laughs> during the first first yeah. year that we were grappling with COVID. But yeah, you know, I, totally I, I brought some recommendations. Uh, I had for one of, an extraordinarily bright guy who 
No, he's going to BC. He was uh, he was trying to decide between McGill and BC. I know who you mean. Yeah, <laughs> we were so hoping he would come. Oh, I you, think you saw that. Okay, I didn't know if you were in exactly what. Uh, I don't see all of them, but I mean, I'm always interested in uh, in students from Japan because I've spent time in Japan myself, and so it's always fascinating to me to see you know how they know about what we do, especially at McGill and so on. Yeah, well, it was a very tight choice, and it had to do with uh, some very, very specific things that he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, I will tell you this, and everything I said about that student was absolutely honest and true. (laughs) Uh, He was so, so fine, and it it was kind of heartbreaking uh, because his last two years of college, he was in his basically in his room studying and yeah. I isolated uh, for, you know, from all of this, but the, uh, the, the faculties he contacted, uh, Canadian faculties, also at U, U of T, mm-hmm. uh, Toronto, um, the, the people there were just so friendly and forthcoming and helpful. And uh, it, it just, you know, you, I think people who are out of academe don't understand. They, they see us sometimes as looking down our nose or being mm-hmm. uh, detached from the reality or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But the people are just so good at these uh, places that he was uh, looking at. And That's good to know. Like, we, we really yeah. do try. Like, I think, you know, the personal connection is really important. We do try to sort of answer everyone's questions and, you know, let them make a decision about whether we're a good fit them ultimately yeah well i've had two uh wonderful experiences on your uh, fairly large campus let's face oh, it uh, and, uh, <laughs> I, I i i was um, asked to do a talk at a theology really a theology conference that was headed by torrence kirby oh yes and, yeah, really, I know torrence, and yeah. uh, that was about 10 years ago and mm-hmm. oh what a wonderful wonderful ex- experience That's great. and i got to meet some uh great uh canadian scholars who Excellent. and uh all from, people from all over the world i guess i was from all over the world yeah. but uh <laughs> Uh, and then there, I went to a digital humanities conference mm-hmm. uh, a few years back. There. Okay, great. And uh, uh, so I, I feel like uh, I know I know the yeah. turf. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, uh, we're really working on uh, desperately trying to expand what the work that we're doing in in DH at the moment. I have a new colleague, Richard So, in, in my department, who's uh, uh, yeah. re- doing really interesting work and kind of really recruiting a lot of students to come join us too yeah yeah well it's it's there uh i think it was uh i think it's kind of become more important after of course uh, everybody had to start learning all of this new technology mm-hmm. but it's it, uh, all of this stuff is stressful <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> now uh i'm going to a conference in england okay. so uh not far from now and i'm going to put myself on an airplane and go so yeah uh, and if i uh, get sick or whatever well that that's you know i'm thinking well you know i'm getting on a basically a big aluminum can and flying across uh war zones or too close yeah. to war zones you know we have to fly south going that yeah. way yeah and, yeah and if i'm going to the if i were going to the states i'd have to go over this large ocean where things just get lost and, and never are found yeah. so you know um you know it's just another one of the stresses of travel Right and has. Well, I'm going. Uh, I'm going to England um, at the end of July for the first time in three years. I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen my family in such a long time. I have a nephew who's two that I've never met. It's like uh, where, where know, I just decided I can't. Where, I can't wait anymore. <laughs> where Where are they? Are Are so? Um, I grew up in Bristol mostly. Um, but my brother and I lives in London, so I'll be mostly in London. Mostly yeah. in London. Well, yeah. it, won't that be nice to get back to London? I can't wait. Yeah. It's yeah. That's uh, just, just wonderful. And it's really just a kind of hopper flight for you, you know? Yeah. It's actually yeah. not that bad. I'm, you know, my daughter can't remember going on a plane. My son, you know, is older and he can remember it, but she's like, she, every day she's like, are we going on the plane today? She's so excited. About it. And she's old enough really to enjoy it now. I think right? so. Yeah. I think and I, uh, Oh no, that would be a wonderful thing. She will remember uh yeah. these these things and uh my my kids did it, uh, the cutoff mm-hmm. there was around three or four years old but after mm-hmm. certainly after four four and after uh they remember and yeah. um yeah. and and getting to um unite again with your family that's just wonderful so you guys are coming to uh I'm, i may be confusing you a little bit with the british system but uh 
uh, are you coming to the end of a term now? We are long done. Yeah, we have extremely oh, that's right. short Canada... and intense semesters. My, yeah, so my... we finished um, mid-April, actually. And uh, I mean, that's you know, right. the grad director right. stuff doesn't end. <laughs> it, I mean, no. it calms down over the summer. So I've been I've been working on that and uh, you know, yeah. prepping to hand over to my colleague. Um, but yeah, we finished teaching a while back now and we're we're done until Labor Day, or just before Labor Day, we'll start back up again. Yeah, I'm we, a, we, we get the reward for the winter, <laughs> which is a nice long summer. Yeah, well, no, my son uh, graduated from Queens uh, mm -hmm. over, over in Kingston. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, paying his tuition and so forth, and he's out of school. Yeah, I'm going, do you guys, do you have any classes? You know, it's April and you're out of school. <laughs> now I remember, I wasn't sure that McGill was on the same system, yeah. but yeah, it would be, uh, get out very early and uh, yeah, it's pretty good yeah but, but you know we have like you know three weeks at, at Christmas basically I know <laughs> it's, it's very intense and we get straight back into it which is a bit of a pain but how, how civilized though how yeah. civilized I, I just think that's wonderful uh, we are unfortunately in a semester system that goes through uh, to the end of July right and um, uh, that's just the way it is in Japan but the, yeah. different with different uh, breaks and sometimes it's hard to coordinate uh, conferences yeah. and things like that but yeah absolutely yeah um well uh, fiona if i may i would like to ask you to stay after we fin finish recording sure. just for a moment but uh for from me and from uh the, the shakespeare society of japan from uh, my colleagues here at aoyama gakuin and so forth and anybody who has come in to listen to you talk about this wonderfully rich area of um, research that you've been doing, uh, we expressed our our uh, deepest uh, thanks and appreciation. You were here, uh, and I met you in person. Yeah, and yeah. I hope I hope that can happen again too. So thank you. I would you love so that. Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the the Japanese Shakespeare community has a very special place in my heart, and I would love to come back at some point. And I also actually um, worked on the the Jet program <laughs> when I was first out of college. So I lived in, in Japan for two years at that point. Yeah. Um, so I would love to be back at some at some stage. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so very much.